Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about here on our second video on exponential functions is the natural base. E. Now, E is a number, and E is equal to 2.718 Two eight one eight two eight, but then it goes on forever. It looks like there might be a pattern here, um, but there really isn't. Um, it, it looks like hey, well wait, you got eight one eight two eight and then one eight two eight. That definitely looks like a pattern, but just to make sure you uh, understand that it's not a pattern. Let me go ahead and get a few more decimal paces for you. So if we continue on after the 1828, it actually then goes um, 459045235360, and then it keeps going on forever. So even though when you look at the first like 10 decimal spots or so, it looks like there's a pattern repeating, as soon as you get a few more down, you can clearly see there's no pattern um, that's repeating. And so this means, just like the number pi, e is an irrational number. Now we will talk about where e comes from, because these irrational numbers aren't just oh, like, oh, someone randomly wrote all these decimal points out and therefore it's the natural exponent. No, it does come from somewhere, just like pi. Pi is irrational. And pi comes from somewhere, and where does it come from? Pi is just the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. Um, and that's what pi is equal. You take any circle, and you take the circumference of it, and divide it by its diameter, and you're going to get uh, pi. So pi was discovered first, primarily because, you know, dealing with circles, you know, was very common thing to do with, and the way that E was discovered um, is dealing with exponential functions. So it was definitely much later on in mathematics. All right, so why do I point that out? Well, the exponential function, the natural exponent, natural exponential function, is f at x equals e to the x. And now, there's not really too much surprising about e to the x. e, remember, is just a number, and it's greater than 0. So if you wanted to think about what the graphs of this, I'll just even do a real rough set of x and y axes here. The graph here is going to intersect this, and it's going to look like any other exponential function. So e to the x. Now, we also will be interested at times e to the negative x, but again, that's just doing a transformation. And so e to the negative x is just the following blue curve. So they look just like regular exponential functions that we talked about in the previous video. Now, one of the reasons we um, talk about e to the x here is because it's uh, Quite frankly, it's a very important function, especially coming into calculus and even in trig. Um, there's something called Euler's identity, um, which actually I'll go ahead, even though this isn't a trig class here, Euler's identity um, or Euler's equation is very important. And it's that if you have e to the i theta, so imaginary number, this is equal to cosine theta plus i times the sine of theta. And again, you know, not part of this course by any means, but this is the natural exponent. My variable here, instead of being x, is just theta is my variable, and then i, of course, is my imaginary number. And I said this is in a very, very important relationship um, used in lots of engineering fields. Um, and so, you know, again, it's not part of this course, but it's something you'll talk about later on. So exponential functions are incredibly important, especially in calculus. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some applications of exponential functions. Okay, so applications of exponential functions. 
So let's first talk about compound interest. That's the one we're going to primarily focus on. And we have a formula here for a compound interest. And A is just your amount here, so let's identify all of these parameters here. A is the future amount, amount of money we'll have in the future, or you could also look at it if you're talking about a loan, the amount of money you might owe if you're not paying on that loan. And then what we have here is P is what's referred to as the principal, or you can think of this as the initial investment. R is the interest rate. And it's the annual interest rate, so sometimes abbreviated APR, annual interest rate, or annual percent rate. Um, but this has to be um, converted to a decimal number. N is the number of compounds in a year. And what that means is the how often is interest calculated. So if you're talking like a savings account or something like that, that's monthly. Um, interest is typically cal calculated monthly. And so N would be 12. Now if you have quarterly, that would be four times a year. You know, daily, well, we'll just say 365. Um, and then you, know, you could do hourly, which, you know, well, 365 times then 24. You know, so we could we could really go kind of crazy if we wanted to. And then T is the number of years that you're not doing anything or that you're letting the interest grow. Okay. So now there is something called continuous compounding, which we'll get to in a second, but let's look at an example here. You invest $1,000 in an account that pay, has an, an APR of, let's say, 5%, which is actually very high. but we'll just keep that as a high interest rate there just so that makes the computations easier. APR 5%. How much money do you have in five years? if compounded quarterly monthly and daily all right so we just need to go ahead and as i said go through and do the math here so we have my formula here Amount is equal to principal times 1 plus r over n to the nt. Now we've got three different problems we have to do here, but some of the things don't change. For all three parts, p is going to be 1,000, that's how much we're investing. t is going to be 5 years, because that's how long it is. And the interest rate is 5%, which means we need to use 0.05 for r. Remember, it has to be converted to a decimal number. And then, of course, n is going to be either 4, 12, or 365. So now we just kind of do a formula plug and chug. 
So let's do first n equals 4. And so the amount would be 1,000 times 1 plus 0.05 over 4 to the 4 times 5. So this would be 1,000 times 1.0125 to the 20th power. So uh, calculating that out, we would get approximately 1,282, and we'll go ahead and round, and 4 cents. So we can see if you had $1,000 at 5%, in 5 years you'll have made $282. And that's just doing nothing. That's just letting it sit in the account and gain interest. Okay, so then let's see what happens if we have n equals 12. Well, if n is equal to 12, it's the exact same equation, except that we're going to have n being 12 now. So it'd be 1,000 times 1 plus 0.05 divided by 12 to the 5 times 12. So this would be 1,000. And this would actually be 1.00416 repeating to the 60th power. So one thing we want to see here is this number inside the parentheses has gotten smaller, but then the exponent I'm using has gotten bigger, because in this example here we had 20 and now we're going to have 60. So let's just finish the computations out. And in this case, the money we would have, if compounded monthly, would be $1,283.34. So we can see we get a little bit more money. Not a lot, but a little bit more. So let's just go ahead and do n equals 365. And I will have then a is equal to 1,000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 over 365 to 5 times 365. Now I'm just going to go ahead and do this in my calculator here as opposed to writing it out. And in this case here, you get A is equal to $1,284. So technically, we still got even a little bit more money. Okay. So now we're going to continue this example and introduce this idea of E again. And the question that was asked, because if you notice, uh, there was this question was asked a long time ago, if you notice that, well, I keep getting a little bit more money. Now, if I keep doing more compounds, like compound hourly, compound minutely, compound seconds, every tenth of a second, eventually kind of getting to this idea of compounding continuously. So that means basically compounding interest every precise moment in time. The question was, can you get infinite money then? Because every time I put in more compounding, I get a little bit more money back. And so it's like, well, continuously, like, like what if I'm always compounding, or my compounding rate is infinite, essentially? Can I get infinite money? Well, the answer is no, you can't. And it turns out there's a formula here for compounding continuously. Compounding continuously 
is the amount is equal to P E to the RT. Notice the number of compounds has dropped out, but here's that natural exponent E. And so if we did this with the same example, this would be 1000 E to the 0 0.05 times 5, which would be 1000 E to the 0.25, which your calculator has an E button. Sometimes it might be, you have to, might have to do a shift or something, um, and it's kind of by the LN, which is natural log, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So 0 0.25, E to the 0.25 times 1,000. And what we get here is one, not 1,000, 1,200. And 84, and I'll go ahead and write some of these decimal do numbers down. 0 0.0254 dot 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 goes on forever. And if we round it, it would be 1284.03. But what this is actually, this is the maximum money that you could get investing a thousand dollars compounding at five percent interest rate. So I have a maximum amount of money that you can get. So even if you compound continuously, you can't just get infinite amount of money. It's limited by this E. And actually, compounding interest is actually how E was discovered. E was discovered by Jacob Bernoulli, who's a very famous mathematician. Um, and it was, he w it was discovered in 1683. So this number is not exactly new. We've We've known about this number for quite a while. And the way it was is there was a question posed, essentially, if you invest $1 in an account that pays 100% interest, is there A maximum or infinite value. Now, if you think about it, if you have a hundred percent interest, which of course is ridiculous, but if you do that and you compound it just once a year, well, if you do it for one year, you'd have one dollar would go to two dollars. Okay, but then if you did it twice a year, you could use the compound interest and you'd get a little bit more than $2. And so what they were looking at is they were looking at the amount equals 1 times 1, because I invested $1 plus interest rate is 100%, so it's 1 over N. And then they did it for one year, so N times 1. And so they were looking at the function 1 plus 1 over N to the n power. Now again, this is investing one dollar at 100% interest for one year. And so if you make a table here for n, and then what one plus one over n to the n power is, well, if you compounded once a year, you'd get two dollars. If you compounded 10 times, you'd get 2.59374246. And then if you compounded 100 times, you'd get 2.70481382.9. And then let's just jump up a little bit here. Let's do 10,000. If you did 10,000, you'd have 2.71814. Five nine two seven, and then if you have jump up one more here, ten million, you would get the value of two point seven one eight two eight one six nine three, and you can see this number e is starting to form here two point seven one eight two eight one, and then we know the next digits would be eight two eight, but what they saw is, is that there is this maximum number that 
this can reach, this value 1 plus 1 over n. And that maximum number is the number e. So that's actually where it came from. It came from doing compound interest. And the joke is always is like, well, it's because they were greedy. Mathematicians wanted a lot of money. So they wanted to see if there was a way to get a, you know, a lot of money out of it. Uh, that's just kind of an old wives tale. I don't think it's part of the story. But um, it is true that uh, Jacob Bernoulli did discover it. Um, and that uh, this is essentially the way it was discovered. Now, if you were to take a course um, calculus eventually, you would talk about this again in more detail because what you would look at is something called a limit. And this limit as you go to infinity is equal to the number e. And in fact, that's one of the definitions of e. One way to define it is to define this as a e as the number that you approach when this thing goes to infinity. Um, but again, that's kind of reserved for another course. All right, so we've talked about some of these uh, exponential functions. Just to kind of give you another um, thing here is you, you also have you know radioactive decay and things like this. Um, so I'll, I'll do one quick more quick example here. So you have carbon 14 which you might know is for carbon-14 dating. You might have heard of that before. Um, the half-life of this is 5,715 years. So let's assume that you had 50 grams of carbon 14. Then a formula to determine the um, amount of carbon left, carbon 14 left after a certain number of years would be, well, it's kind of like the compound interest one, but not exactly. You start with an initial amount of 10 times, and then, well, I have a half-life. So, one-half t over 5,715. And why would that be half? Well, half-life means after one year you would have half of it left. And I'm not 10. This is, I don't start with 10, I start with 50. So after one year I'd have 25 grams of carbon-14, because it decays into another um, substance. Um, and so I don't have tw 50 grams after a year, I'd have 25. Um, but then after another year I'd have half of 25, which is this exponential decay. And that's where this one half comes in, half-life, so half of it's going to be gone, but how long does it take? 5,715 years. So if you want to talk about how would we compute this, like how much is left after 15,000 years, well, we could just do Q is equal to 50 times 1 half, and yeah, I know I could rewrite that without the negative, but I'm just plugging a number in here, so it doesn't matter. 15,000 divided by 5, 7, 18. So this would be 50 times 0 0.5 to the 15,000 divided by 5,715. And then we go just um, plug and chug this through here. So I'll just do this real quickly on my calculator. And you'd wind up with 8.11 grams. still of carbon-14. Now you can say that makes somewhat sense because what is 15 divided by 5,715? Well, if we want to just be ballparking it, it's not even that accurate. Well, 15,000 divided by 5 is, is 3. So it's not quite 3 half-lives, but it's going to be somewhere a little less than 3 half-lives. Well, if we did um, half-life here and did half of 
um, 15,000, um, not fat, half of 50, you get 25, and then half of 50 again, you get 12.5. So you are getting something that is somewhat reasonable here. All right, but this is going to um, wrap up our discussion on exponential functions, and then we will go ahead and move into logarithmic functions in the next set of videos here.